Hey, um, I wanted to talk today about reading scholarly articles. So as you're doing your research, one of the things you should really focus on having is some of these scholarly or peer-reviewed articles. So they're written for journals that are in the field. A journal is just a magazine that is for people in the field. Um, and they do require a higher standard of research, of um, data backing it up, things like that. And a lot of times as a student, and even for me at this point in my life, I can look at them and just go cross-eyed. Oh, what are you talking about? Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit. I know I've, it's in writing down the basics, but I wanted to kind of show you some of the keys and tips to both researching to find them, things you need to think about, and um, I want to look at two of them because they're kind of different ways they can be presented and how to read them without and be able to read through all the craziness. So um, let's take a look. This first one is um, that I have um, up here is one that is um, it's um, a, a scholarly article. So we have um, the um, title. It is Advertising and Labor Supply, Why Do Americans Work Such Long Hours? This is from the International Review of Applied Economics. That's the journal. One of the ways we know it's a journal is we've got volume and number. There's our date and there's the page numbers that it's on. Um, and here you'll see we actually have those actual page numbers on each page. Technically in citing this we could cite this like a print source since we have all that information. Um, we have the authors, and you'll notice A, Culling, is um, Department of Economics at University of Warwick in the UK, and then, and as, it, as is, um, Paul Sambat, and then Tomlinson is at the University of Bath in the UK. And one of the things, whenever you are um, giving credi credibility on your paper, you need to... Um, like with an article like this, you would want to tell like what their field is or what they're working in. And if you have multiple authors, if you have a bunch, like eight, you can just talk about the lead author, the first name mentioned. So you can say so-and-so and his colleagues or so-and-so and her colleagues, so-and-so who works at um, or, you know, is a specialist in this and his or her colleagues, whatever it is. Um, so if you have a, like a bunch of authors and they may be from different universities, different workplaces, whatever. You can really just focus on that first one because that's the lead person. That's generally the person who kind of got the group together and said, let's do this. Um, with an example like this, um, where we have three authors, two of them are from the same um, um, school, and um, we've got economics and we've got management, we could say something like Cowling, Pulsenbot, and Tomlison who, um, you know, work at um, universities in the United Kingdom and focus on economics and management. We can kind of just summarize it, and then that way it gets all of it. People want to know more, they'll look at this article and figure that out. Um, so one of the things that an article often gives you at the beginning or the end is that here's an uh, article that is HTP, I mean HTML, so it is not... Um, in um, it's not uh, PDF so a lot of times the articles will have it either at the top where they're from it may be at the bottom of that first page in a note um, or it may be at the very end of the article with this one let's see what we get and here's one where we have well, we're 8,000 authors um, so we're not going to go through and give credibility for each one Dennis T. Virial here his name is first. That means everybody decided, you know, this is, um, you get the main credit. He did the most work. He's got the biggest name, whatever it is. Do notice they did give us MD, MD, PhD, PT, this physical therapist, um, another physical therapist. Um, so we have um, their kind of basic qualifications. A lot of times at the end of the article, we'll see, oh, author affiliations. This gives us, um, you know, names. So from the Division of Endocrinology, da 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 da, we have these authors, you know, both in Houston, this, that, um, and then it tells us other places 
Dr. Virial here is Baylor College of Medicine. So whenever we're doing credibility for this, since there are so many authors, we can just focus on Virial and you know give his credibility and his team looked at this. So in terms of looking at one of these articles, that's how we're going to figure out credibility and what we'll do with that. Okay, so let's talk about how we read this. Um, this little part of the first is the abstract, and in your paper you'll be doing an abstract. Remember, it's written after you've written the paper. Once you write the paper, then you can say this is what it's about. So this gives us what it's about. Now, you're always going to be expected to read at a higher level than you write at, which means you're going to have to do some looking up vocabulary. The nice thing about doing this is on a, on a computer, you've got things right in front of you. Um, and then you also have to make decisions in reading these about how much do you need to know. For example, these um, people are, their specialty is economics and management, so they're going to be using a lot of that stuff that I may not need to know. What I need to know is really what do you say in the end. Um, so like here they say in exploring this argument we employ vector auto regression analysis to estimate long run supply schedules. Okay. Um, do I really need to know what vector auto regression analysis is if I'm looking at, you know, American working hours and should we work more or less or do we work too much or whatever my topic is? Probably not. And that's one of the key things is you won't read all of the study unless you're in that field and you're doing research on that same thing. Then you want to look at how the study was done. You want to know how they did it. What we really want to know is one, it's a good source, which it coming from a journal is one of the first clues. It coming from writers who are in the field is another clue. Um, and then it, um, you know, thinking about how they write, is it clean writing, all of those other things that we look to in evaluating sources. Um, so really what you want to do as you look through these is decipher between where's the just kind of the information they came up with overall and where's the stuff that is, if they have a study like this one, part of their study that I'm not going to recreate, okay? Um, so they talk about, they say this paper advances the view that the intensity of creation of wants through advertising and marketing might be an influence on, de on decisions made by Americans about how much time they should devote to paid work and how much time to leisure time. This is the kind of writing you need to learn to do. This is not crazy big, but it is a different way of stating things. So read slowly, read out loud, um, those kinds of things help when you're not sure about, um, you know, a word, any word, intensity, it doesn't matter what word it is. I know in um, using Chrome, I can highlight it and then click search Google for intensity and it will bring up one of the first things is the definition. And this is true of phrases too. Um, now this says this relationship was investigated. A lot of times, not always right after the first paragraph, but usually you'll have an introduction. And then a lot of times what you get after that is kind of what's the research that's gone before? And, you know, kind of what have people discovered or thought before? So you want to read through this part too if you decide this article's for you because this may lead you to their giving some research and they'll have references, their references at the end. You may read some of this and say, okay, hey, maybe I want to use some of those sources too, which is another reason we cite is because we're sharing our sources. Um, and so they talk about what, you know, they kind of, what they're postulating and we're of the opinion that more research should be done, advertising, you know, how it affects us as workers in the U.S., um, and so what do they want to look at? We'd read through this. Um, here we'd argue that there's a difference between Western Europe and the United States. So we want to read through this. We're putting forth this hypothesis. This is what we think. Um, and then here they just kind of talk about what they talk about in different sections. And that's appropriate if you're writing a very long paper. Notice this is 20 pages. Um, if you're writing a short paper like we are, you don't want to say up front really, you know, I'll talk about this and this section and this and that section. Um, so they go into each section, advertising and hours of work, um, and talk about kind of the correlation there. So they'll give us that. That would be good to read. Um, some of these tables, sometimes tables, 
they help you out. They're very clear. For example, here we have 1941 through 1950, advertising expenditure, dollars and billions, um, advertising messages. And so here we could look. Um, see, here they're going into economic stuff, and I'm like, I don't know. All right. Um, but advertising intensity, um, this doesn't give us a whole lot of information if we're not in that field. So we could look at it, you kind of figure that out, some will, some won't. Um, they go through each section and talk about kind of background and what's the other research there. So this is just another kind of research paper. Again, kind of what I generally do is skim through and then when I find parts that it's like, okay, this is important, I slow down and I read it out loud. Um, now here we get to something where this looks a lot like math. This is economics. Um, if you're going into advanced economics, this is what you will be looking at. Um, and so this is how they did their research. So not only did they do research about what did other people say, but they say we want to look at it too. And so this is their formula for that. I don't understand that formula. I do not have an advanced degree in economics. You don't either, or likely you don't. Um, so you're not supposed to. It's okay. What they're just telling us in the middle here is, how did we do this study? Um, and the results are going to be very much focused in their field. So we can see they've got all this jargon and these, these formulas going in here. Um, these are not things we have to know. Often when you get to a section that says discussion, it will be what you want to read. But in this one, they use a different term for it. Um, but anytime I see discussion, I'm going to slow down because everything above that was really here's how we did our formulas to kind of look and see, you know, how much advertising versus working hours going up and down. Um, and they say advertising appears to have a significant impact in both the identified male, female, and manufacturing production workers, long run labor supply relations. The advertising coefficient, and if I'm like, what do they mean by coefficient here? Again, I'm going to look up, but there it is math, there it is physics. I'm going to just kind of keep going on, see what I find. Um, is positive, blah, 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 blah. So we'll read on. Um, I'd read a little bit of it and see if this is still really using Johansson's co-integer estimator. Again, that's part of how they did the research. But notice that you can co-integration. Um, if we go down here, we would find it in here. Um, so I realize, you know, this isn't really just kind of the general stuff. Here, they call theirs concluding comments. In this paper, we have argued the results demonstrate the possibility that high observed hours of work are a result of a desire of workers to work longer due to a shift in their preferences from leisure to increased consumption. Boom. All of a sudden I know what they found. And so it has a lot of implications. And so if many people believe that Americans... So this is where I'm really going to read really slowly and carefully and look at that. And then at the end, there are notes where they had notes in their paper, um, but also their references. So as I've read through there, or even once I'm done, I'm going to look at, you know, say, hey, do I want to read this article? Um, I'm going to make sure I notice the date. Okay, so what's the date? Um, just because it's older doesn't mean I might not use it, but I definitely want things that are a little newer, especially when we're looking at something cultural, something scientific, something medical, something that really does change quite a bit. Um, though some of these may be good kind of background. So that's the key to reading something that's set up like this. Um, that definitely is um, for the field of economics, but we take information from that too. So I'd read the introduction. In this case, I would read that last section um, that they had where it really is what their conclusions are, their concluding comments, and then I'd probably go back through and skim the rest. In an article like this, um, here we have background. The minute you've seen methods, you know, again, it's some sort of study where they have, um, like this is a medical one, um, this is aerobic or resistance exercise or both in dieting older obese adults. Um, 
So they're doing a medical study. Um, so they're going to have a lot of the technical stuff in it. And once you see that, you kind of think, okay, I'm going to read the introduction, and then I'm going to look for those other key parts. One of the things with studies you do want to do is look at how many participants, if they were doing something. I mean, if it's just two people, it's not very representative. Here's 141. That's really not bad for a study, especially with exercise and nutrition. So, you know, we're like, okay, that gives us something to look at. That's that. Um, gives us kind of some ideas. And this has conclusion here. This is clearly just the read it quick, quick part. What we want to do is go down, and here's the beginning of their article. And so um, we're going to read the first of this, if I'm going to use this. The methods, again, I'd probably skim through them. Participants definitely want to look, does this fit in with what I'm talking about, or could I use it as an example, or even if I wasn't talking about older adults, could I say, okay, here's what we know for older adults, and, um, you know, how does that apply to everyone else? The study outcomes, um, again, I'm just going to look at it. Intervention, this is more of what they did, and so what we want is not necessarily what they did, but... Um, what they found out. And so then they break it down, which if you have a background, you're going into medicine, you might want to look at those. Um, you know, we want to look at, I'd kind of skim through them, like ability to perform activities of daily living was assessed. Um, we assessed that, we assessed that. See, they're not telling us what they learned, just what did we look at so far. Um, and they looked at, um, <clears throat> give us that statistical analysis. So what is it? Now, results is something that seems like, ooh, I'd want to read this. But again, a lot of times it really is just the raw data. It's just like, here's what we found. You can check out the tables, the figures, all that stuff. So it really doesn't always help us get there. Here we go. In this one, they have discussion. And so the discussion is where we get to more. Um, despite a negative energy balance, aerobic training improved cardio cardiovascular fitness and resistance training improved strength. Well, I might not know what a negative energy balance is, but you know what? And I checked this one out before. Google does. Um, so energy balance, when you're in a neg negative one, just like that. So again, remember, you have all that at your fingertips. Um, so I'm definitely going to read through this discussion, highlight or, or <clears throat> you know, pull out anything that I'm like, I might want to use a quote or these are statistics I want to know. Um, and then um, that's where I'm really going to find the meat of the kind of meaning making. And that's what the discussion is. What do you think overall? Um, so there's just kind of... Um, a couple of things about reading articles in terms of doing your searches when you're on the library and remember anymore at the library you have to with the new website comes up all pretty but you gotta scroll down and you'll find that search box um, with the library um, I really suggest you limit it to scholarly or peer-reviewed and then here like you can go in and just type in um, say we want to look at 2015 through 2019 and I enter and this will narrow it down. Oh, I've timed out. But anyway, it would narrow it down for you and give you the, um, just give you the information from that. With um, Google Scholar, I'm not sure where my, oh, it was here. Um, Google Scholar, you just click on, like, since 2015, and that'll narrow it down that way. Um, so, um, overall, I hope that helps out a bit. Um, as, again, we're looking for, college level research. So if you find something that says juvenile literature, unless it's like the topic you're talking about, um, doing some analysis of that. Um, when you read it, it, it doesn't doesn't all have to make you cross-eyed, um, but at the same time you want to make sure that you are finding those higher level sources. There's one more thing I'll show you real quick. Let me find it. There are a couple of things on the web that sometimes can look um, what we might think is college level, but they're really actually more secondary or tertiary, third level sources. Um, take this for example, this is Psychology Today, so it's really much more of a mainstream magazine, even though it's like psychology. Um, 
So we have Gary Small, MD. So I mean, that's cool. He's a doctor. And that's the same thing we've looked at these other ones. So, you know, I'm not saying that he's not credible. But this article he's writing is really more of an article kind of in general. And so can exercise cure depression? Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm going to look and see it's from 2010, and I'd probably move on. But for the sake of showing you about this, um, one of the things you'll notice is that a good source will always, of course, you know, say where they got their sources. So colleagues from Duke University care compared antidepressant effects of um, aerobic exercise to popular medicine as well as a sugar pill. Um, so one of the things I would want to do is actually look for and find this study. And in different places in here there will be links um, or in good sources there are links um, and um, things that lead to those. Here we don't really have that. Um, and so this does tell us you know who he is and what he does and so that's cool um, but he does of course say it's that Duke study and so we could look for it that way this may give us some different ideas but in terms of using it as a source it's really not a very good one here's another one um, natural happiness <coughs> excuse me the truth about exercise and depression um, and so this guy talks about it and he gives us um, one of the most famous experiments published in the Journal of Behavioral Medicine, and then he gives us the author's name, Blumenthal. So we know, and we could definitely look this up. Um, uh, and this links directly um, to it. Now, I would say we should call this the study by Bobby Yak et al., because that is the first name given. Okay, um, <coughs> so this gives us that and again you can see methods and results and all of that but what part do we really want to read that introduction and theoretically the discussion it depends um, definitely towards the end of it um, but starting off by reading this will kind of give us an overview of the study as a whole so it's helpful it's just that here's the original thing right and then here's somebody just talking about the original thing. So you can see that difference between the primary and then the secondary um, the, the secondary source here. Um, so it's really good to kind of give us this overview and um, he kind of lays it out very simply but in the end when we are um, citing we're going to want to use this because this is the primary source. Another reason we're going to want to use this is check it out James Clear about I click on about takes me over here here's here's mr. clear all right um, looks like a happy guy I like people who smile I smile a lot so it looks like a happy guy cool beans um, he says I'm an American author entrepreneur photographer um, this website's my life work I'm trying to answer how can we live better so I mean yeah he's a dude out there doing research but he's a dude out there doing research so it helps when we do research and we share it in different ways but what we want to get to in terms of the college level stuff is say okay and where did you get your sources and so this is a great example of something that um, really um, is a good source to kind of lead us to the other sources and and it, it has that nice where he's got the link directly to that article it's it's a very responsible source um, but it gets us to that primary source. So um, those are just some notes and thoughts on one reading academic articles and these kinds of things um, that you don't have to read it all, but kind of how to look through it, um, how to look things up, look things up um, as you read. Read out loud when you're reading the dense stuff. I mean, really stop and read out loud slowly, carefully. You have paragraphs or parts that you really need to understand. <laughs> whether it's for your research here or for another course whatever it is slow down read it out loud fast reading is not good efficient reading it's just fast reading um, so anyway um, I hope that's helpful and keep those things in mind as you're doing your research because the quality of your sources will play a big role in the quality of your final project so take care